Good morning, Community of Grace. So glad to have you here with us this morning. Also grateful for you who are watching online as we begin our service together today. Happy Fourth of July. It is good to be celebrating Independence Day today. And while it's quite rare that Independence Day falls on a Sunday, we want to acknowledge that today and be grateful for living in a free land. And as Scripture teaches us, we are taught to pray for the land in which we live and for uh, its governance and for its leadership. And we're going to do that today before we begin our service in the form of a song. So if you would please stand this morning, lift your voices together as we sing this prayer today, God Bless America. And you may be seated as we continue in worship together today. We begin today in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John 1 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in that promise from the word of God, please take a moment to silently confess your sin. Most merciful God, we confess that without Christ, we are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, sent Jesus to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sin. In, in the authority of Scripture, 
and by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. I tell you, by his promise, what you have confessed has been forgiven. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gracious Heavenly Father, help us to be rooted in your love and grow in your love and guide our actions as we pray for one another and live in the world as disciples of Jesus. Holy Spirit, stir within each one of us to remind us that we are motivated by love for one another and for God. We also pray for our leaders. We pray blessings upon them, your wisdom and your discernment for them to lead this country into the future. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. Our reading today comes from the gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 6, beginning at verse 31. Glory to you, O Lord. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, friends, we are continuing on our summer current sermon series entitled Matthew. Pretty straightforward, yes? The Gospel according to Matthew, the ABCs of Matthew, is a reading guide that we've prepared for you to be able to work your way along with us through the Gospel of Matthew, and it feels like we're just getting started. There is so much within the Gospel of Matthew. It's a powerful message, and it's a message that is placed first within the New Testament, and there's a reason for that. It's meant to be a powerful transition and continuation of the story of Israel that is completed in the person of Jesus Christ. And it starts with a potent message, a message that is carried all throughout the Gospel of Matthew, and that is this. Jesus is the true Messiah and true King of Israel. If you catch nothing else, if that one can stay in your mind as you continue to work your way through the pages of Matthew, I tell you, I believe the Holy Spirit will do a work in you and help you to come into a new and greater understanding of what it is that is so potent and powerful about Matthew sharing of the good news about Jesus. Because that good news comes right from that place. Jesus is the Messiah and the true King of Israel. Without that, the message can just become a disconnected series of stories. That's why we want that to stay in your mind, even as you come and go throughout the course of this summertime. Stay within the book of Matthew. We've gone through a few different weeks of starting off with the birth narrative of Jesus and moving on into Jesus' baptism by John in the River Jordan continuing on to his experience in the wilderness. And then last week, Pastor Angie began what is perhaps the centerpiece to the Gospel of Matthew, at least in its early sections. This Gospel is about the king and his kingdom, and here we have something called the Sermon on the Mount. And it doesn't stand alone, but it is potent and powerful. And it's, I would say without a doubt, the greatest sermon ever preached because it's Jesus himself who preaches this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Hillside, the Sermon on the Plain, as others have called it. All of those are appropriate. This powerful, potent sermon and teaching 
from Jesus. I would say that what this sermon truly is to us as followers of Jesus is our kingdom constitution. Jesus lays out within these three chapters, chapter 5, 6, and 7, a potent vision for what the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is meant to be. And how Jesus is proclaiming that kingdom, is coming in to become that kingdom, is launching a new place of that kingdom, inaugurating it, putting it into place so that it would be carried out into the future and ultimately consummated at his return, which we still await. This kingdom constitution in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus establishes how things are meant to be in his kingdom. And it is radically different from the kingdoms of this world. It's an upside-down kingdom. And as we listened and learned last week about who is in in this kingdom, Pastor Angie did a brilliant job of reminding us the importance of knowing that in Jesus' kingdom, often those who think they are in are missing the point. Jesus drives home the fact that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, not for those who consider themselves righteous, but for those who hunger and thirst, desiring God's righteousness, knowing their need and bringing that need before God himself. This is where Jesus meets us. This is how he proclaims how things will be in his kingdom. So today we're going to dive into the second part of this kingdom constitution, looking at Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. I'm going to read this significant portion of scripture to you this morning, but I want to set the stage for us, just like Pastor Angie did last week. I want us to put ourselves there, at the foot of Jesus, with many of his followers seated around him, listening to his words, listening with a sense of anticipation, knowing what they have seen, what they have heard about who this Jesus is, the miracles that he has performed, the authority in which he teaches. Let's set our hearts in that place to listen to this passage from Jesus, beginning in chapter 6, verse 1. These are the words of Jesus. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast... Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your beard and wash your head and your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen 
and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Three acts of what would be easily called Jewish piety. Almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. These three things were central to an expression of the Jewish faith. As a matter of fact, they were central to all of the Abrahamic faiths. A central place of giving to the needs of others. A central place of praying for the spiritual concerns of others. And a place of fasting, of self-denial, a confession that our complete dependence is on God for all that we need. If you're familiar with the season of Lent, which comes around every year here within our Christian calendar, all three of these are represented in what are called our Lenten disciplines. Taking time to give particularly to the needs of the poor. Often we place our focus upon Haiti during that time. To be praying regularly for the needs of our community and those around us. Seeking God in prayer and seeking the best for others, interceding for them. And fasting, making an intentional decision to deny ourselves of something, not because that somehow impresses God, but it reminds us of our place before God as one needing and recognizing that all good gifts come from God himself. Jesus is explaining something about these three practices, and he has a concern about the way in which he is seeing them practice and wishes to redefine these practices within the confines of the kingdom that he has come to inaugurate. In this kingdom constitution, Jesus is doing something particular and specific. He wants people to understand that these, not, these things are not for the consumption of others, but they are meant to be attitudes of the heart. Jesus is asking about motivation. And what Jesus is so eloquently addressing in these passages is the fact that often the motivation that he witnessed and that he saw was an outward motivation, a motivation to be seen by others. Look at me. Look at me. See how pious I am. See how righteous I am. Look at what I do for the sake of others. Self-righteousness. Acts of self-righteousness. An outward motivation. Now, please understand, Jesus is speaking in hyperbole here. An important thing to understand when reading Scripture He's talking about the hypocrites standing on the street corners and playing to the sound of trumpets as they put their money into the temple box. Now, listen, if that was actually practiced, it's not recorded much else within Jewish thought. But Jesus is making a point. He's saying, look, if you're going to go to the extreme of being seen, this is what it looks like. It looks like play acting. And you're doing it for the sake of others to be seen. Now, Jesus isn't against giving publicly. Jesus isn't against praying publicly as we come together. As a matter of fact, he invites his servants to pray and often does those prayers together with many present. But he's making a point about motivation. If that motivation comes from outside, you've missed the point. You see, when your righteous acts point back to you, you have missed Jesus' point. You've missed the point in the giving of alms. You've missed the point in the giving of prayers. You've missed the point in the giving up of what it is that you have and what you think you provide for yourself for the sake of Jesus. You see, each one of these is an aspect of giving. To give out for the sake of the needs of those around you, their physical needs, 
seeking ways to be able to bless others. And then we give over in prayer, bringing before God the needs of others. And then we give up, confessing our complete dependence on God. God, you are the one who provides, not me. I give up trying to provide for myself. This is almsgiving. This is prayer giving. This is giving something up in fasting. And it's not meant to point towards you. There's an inward motivation, a motivation of the heart that God sees, and that is the only thing that brings true value and eternal value to the acts that we do, these acts of righteousness. And it's one word, and the word is love. Now, it's easy to hear that word and think, oh, here we go again. Love, yeah, pastor, we get it. Yep, Jesus is about love. It's about loving your neighbor. Yeah, okay, but can we now we move on? No, we can never move on past the point of love. Because the inward motivation of love is the most important factor in how it is we reveal Jesus to the world. Friends, unconditional love is the only motivation that reveals Jesus' kingdom in your life and in the world. No other motivation will cut it. Now, there are many other motivations we can say might bring about some earthly good. But if we're talking about something that is going to impact people for the sake of Jesus' gospel, the good news about this kingdom then the only motivation that works is a motivation of love. The Apostle Paul emphasizes this so deeply in 1 Corinthians when he dedicates an entire chapter to saying everything that you do, if it's not grounded in love, it's just making noise. We're called to love. Jesus' simplification of loving God and loving our neighbor as being the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets cannot be overlooked or understated or overstated. This is the key. Unconditional love is the only motivation that reveals Jesus' kingdom in your life and in the world. You see, you can give without loving. People do it all the time. You can give from a motivation of frustration. Yes, if you'll just leave me alone, here's a dollar, child. There are many other motivations you can find that are related to giving. And you can give without loving. But you can't love without giving. To love God and to love your neighbor brings about an inward transformation of the heart that then sees your neighbor the way that God sees your neighbor and the way that God sees you. Through his eyes of unconditional love. This constitution of the kingdom that Jesus is laying out throughout each of the chapters of the Sermon on the Mount is all centered on this one heart of the matter. And that is that none of it matters apart from love. Love is the currency of the kingdom of God. When we talk about giving, it is from a place of love that everything comes to have value. Everything else in this world will pass away. Everything that you own, everything that you have, everything that you have saved, everything that you try to hold on to and keep, all of it will go away, but this will remain love. And faith and hope 
The greatest of these is love. So how do we respond to this kind of love? Well, we respond to this love by giving. We give out from love. We do that in our regular offerings within our church services, but we do it in other ways when we are seeing needs in our community, whether it's a special offering that we are doing here or a place that you are engaged in your workplace or in your neighborhood. When you see a need and love motivates your heart to give, you then offer. It now is an offering that is acceptable before the Lord. It's one that God looks upon and says, yes, I see you, and I see your heart. And we give over in love when we pray. Jesus puts right within the middle of this great kingdom constitution what I would call our declaration of dependence. It's the Lord's Prayer. The truest declaration of dependence that we could ever say. Beginning with that place of the love of God the Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Begins in that place of love, and then it is an expression of God's love for you and for the world. And then we give up and over to love. When we look at what we have and we say, Lord, all of this comes from you. And I'm reminded again that none of it is anything that I have earned. None of it is anything that I can hope to provide for myself. However it has come to me, it has come to me as a gift of your providence, of your provision in my life. You know, one of our core values here at CGLC is that love pours out. But you can't pour out what you don't have in you. If you try to pour out from that which is not in you, you'll either become a faker or a failure. If you give out of some other motivation to impress others or to to act from some place of, of pride in yourself, ultimately you will become a Pharisee if it's motivated by anything other than love. Or you will come to a place of realizing, you know what, I just can't and I'm tired of trying, and you quit. But if we let God's love pour into us, we become free followers. Followers who have been set free, free from any thought that we can do this ourselves, free from any notion of self-righteousness, free to love God and be loved by God, the source of all life. You know, we've watched something happen over the course of our return into our post-COVID reality. And it's not something that's just happening here at Community of Grace. As I've spoken with other pastors and, and heard news stories from other sources within the church and within many nonprofit organizations, is that they're having a really, really hard time finding volunteers right now. Why is that? It's not because people are unfaithful. It's because folks are tired. They've lost connection with one another, and in many cases within the church community, they've lost connection with the fellowship and then community with God himself. And from that place of emptiness, they feel like there just isn't anything more that I can possibly give out. You know what? I understand. It has been tiring. And as we come back together, before we can say to you, listen, you need to shape up and start giving more. You need to shape up and and start serving more. You need to shape up and, and start being more at work, more, 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 more. We need to acknowledge that 
we have need ourselves. And that need comes from the love of God and is meant to pour into you before you can pour it out. So that's why we want to invite you. I want to invite you to be filled with God's love. I want to invite you to come to this table today. Today, for the first time in over a year, as we come together and worship here, we're going to be up at the kneelers again. It's the right posture for us to take before the Lord today. And as you make your way up, there's going to be offering plates. A place for you to give out. We will share together in the Lord's Prayer a place for giving over. And a place of declaring before the Lord our utter dependence on him as we kneel before the King of kings and Lord of lords and have him pour into us exactly what we need. So come to this table today and let God's love that has been poured out for you pour into you. And from that place, let it carry us forward out of a motivation of love. Not so that anybody can see us or so that anybody could see you, but so that the world can see Jesus alive and well. And then let me also invite you to come to Love Pours In on July 18th, just two weeks from today. That evening, we're going to spend some time in worship, just receiving and responding to God's love and allowing his love to pour into us. Don't miss out on an opportunity to let God's love pour into you. And then finally, just continue being filled with the love of God by reading through Matthew over the course of of this summer. I hope you've been taking advantage of the opportunity to be reading through Matthew. It's come alive to me in new ways this summer as well after a long season. It's good to just be refreshed in God's love and God's word. So come to the table. Come let love pour into you from the body and blood of Jesus. Come to Love Pours In on July 18th Continue in your reading of God's word, letting his love pour into you through his spirit, speaking his word to you. Friends, it's a season to let love pour in so that love can pour back out again from us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that comes to us today in you, in person, Jesus, speaking to us from the sermon that you shared with your disciples some 2,000 years ago, being visible and tangible to us through your body and blood, which we will partake in together. All of these are signs of your love, your love for a broken world, your love for your church that is meant to be a sign to the world, your people called by your name, living in a radical, unconditional love that all points back to you, Jesus, and never to ourselves. So Lord, in those places where we have pointed to ourselves, Father, forgive us. And Lord, in those places where we are tired, where people are feeling the weariness of having seen so much need around them and trying to meet it in their own strength, Lord, would you have mercy on us? Would you let your love and your grace pour into each of those places that need to be healed, to be refilled? And then love, Father, out of a response of love from our hearts. Help us to see the needs around us, Lord through your eyes, and through your strength. 
Lord, that we would give out to those around us, that we would give over to you the needs and concerns that we have, and that we would give up any sense of providing for ourselves. It's all to you, Jesus, the author and giver of life. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand together now, friends, as we declare God's love to us in our sermon here. Please follow the uh, instructions from the ushers as they lead you up to uh, receive communion. You may either kneel or stand at the railing. Please remain there until everyone has been served and we'll give you a blessing at the end. There are um, baskets if you bring, brought your offering today on both sides here. So on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the end of supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.
Come, everything is ready. Come to the table.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, please pay attention to the next steps. Good morning, Community of Grace. I am CGLC Facilities Manager Paul Wetterling, and here are some next steps at CGLC. Happy Fourth of July, everyone. We're celebrating our independence with a seasonal treat for you in the Commons. If you enjoy our hospitality, help us keep the coffee flowing by joining our volunteer team. Reach out to Hannah Collins at the Orange Wall. Then, join us for Love Pours In on Sunday, July 18th at 6.30. It's a night of extended worship to celebrate the many volunteers we have at CGLC. Our dedicated volunteers help make worship, hospitality, and much more happen for our CGLC family. And if you're looking to get more connected here at Community of Grace, our series of Catalyst discussions might be your next step. We will begin this five Sunday pathway to baptism and membership on Sunday, September 19th. Finally, the current is back. Be sure to pick up your copy before you leave today. This edition has details on July and August events here at CGLC. Remember, you can stay connected to all things CGLC by downloading the app or at gracepeople.church. Thanks for joining us this morning and have a blessed week. Please stand as we sing our closing chorus together today. serve the Lord.